Hello everyone. So um, yeah, as the slide says, this is a, an introduction to Quantuma um, and how we can help Armadillo, Armadillo members and their clients. So a brief overview of what we'll be talking through, uh, an introduction and a little bit about us um, and the expertise that we can bring to you and your clients, what you can expect from us and the value that we add and what should be on your radar, a few, a few hints and tips. Uh, and your key points of contact around the business. So this was me, a photo taken pre-lockdown. Um, so it looks like, well, frankly, it looks like I've had a midlife crisis over the last two years. But uh, I, so I am uh, based in the Birmingham office at Quantum I head up the Birmingham office. Um, I'm a director and licensed insolvency practitioner. Um, my role within the business is advising directors and SMEs um, whenever they uh, fall upon hard times and have a problem within their business. Um, we do also do some personal insolvency advice, but my role is predominantly corporate insolvency. Uh, so as touched upon, we do have some high profile assignments at the moment. So I am at Pride Park as we speak. Um, so we're working on the administration of Derby County. Um, we also have a specialism in uh, law firm insolvency. Uh, so one large assignment that I've worked with worked on since being at Quantuma was the administration of KWM or King and Woman Mallisons, which was the largest law firm failure in Europe. Um, and another one is I am currently the liquidator of the uh, Manchester business of NCP, so car parks. So a few high profile things there. And now, yeah. Sorry, um, uh, Richard, I was just going to say as well, just for, for our members, I've also given or referred quite a lot of clients to Brian Burke on the yeah. sort of recovery side for people affected sure. by the loan charge who uh, I guess have got past the point where I uh, have been able to help them, you know, with time to pay and substandard offers and so on. Um, and therefore they've needed personal insolvency advice or indeed on a sort of the corporate, some, you know, as well. So Brian's very familiar with a lot of cases. So if anyone's got, uh, any members have got cases uh, affected by that, then um, Brian's certainly been uh, heavily involved in quite a few. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's had long-standing uh, relationships with HMRC. And so he, as you say, he's very well placed to advise in that regard. So over to Matt. Thanks, Richard. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Matthew Brannan. Uh, I work with uh, the KBS corporate division, which we'll explain a bit later on within the group. Um, I've been with the company now for over eight years. Uh, in a previous life, I Back in the 90s, I started off with Pearl Assurance, if you remember them, as a, as a financial advisor and then worked for Woolwich Builder Society, then Barclays as, a, as an IFA, and then in latter years as a, a mortgage advisor in, in London for one of the big London brokers. So, yeah, my role really is to, to I suppose, be sort of the, the liaison between small business owners, that's, what, that's who we deal with uh, across the UK, which we'll talk about a bit later on, um, and just those that are possibly thinking about exiting from their business and, you know, our, our role, the corporate team that we talk about, is to help business owners who are thinking of this, whether, whether that be retirement, whether they've sort of hit a bit of a you know, crossroads about what they want to do with their business, whether they've started another business and want to move on to it, you know, we can generally help with most avenues on there. So most small business owners have never done it before. So they're all a bit, you know, generally a bit nervous, don't understand what it's all about, what's involved. So my role is to talk them through it, you know, give them some guidance, give them some guidance on value, I suppose hold their hand through it. I mean, you probably all heard this yourself. You get a lot of company owners that talk about, you know, it's their baby and they, you know, they're very nervous about stepping away from it. So yeah, it's, it's really just trying to explain in plain English that this is what's involved. If it's, you know, if now's not the right time, if, you know, they've got a value expectation that probably is a little bit on the rich side, then, you know, we can talk about what maybe how to get to that point and okay, well, what do they need to do with their profits and their assets and you know, the, the business side of things from there. So that, that's what I do. Um, and yeah, this last year, it's been good for it. Typically the, the structure of the companies we've got, uh, you know, we were regional directors around the UK, but as, as we've gone into more of a Zoom focus now, I'm, I'm speaking to people sort of all, all over the UK as, as my colleagues are uh, dotted around the country. So yeah, that's, that's me. Okay. So as this slide says, Quantuma as of August, 2020 is part of the K3 Capital Group. Um, and uh, the group, uh, is a listed business uh, that provides a range of advisory services to SMEs across the UK and also overseas. 
Uh, this slide, which I'm not going to go through in too much detail, covers the other brands within the group. So Quantum is, Quantum is not on here, but the other brands that, uh, that comprise the group. And I think Matt's going to touch on some of this later on. Okay, so this slide, this slide is about Quantum. Um, so we are, uh, we started out as a, a, a restructuring and insolvency business, um, but we have branched out into other uh, services uh, that complement that offering. Uh, so Quantum now also offers corporate finance, forensic accounting and restructuring services. So we work alongside banks, uh, major law firms, PE houses, hedge funds, um, various lenders and of course accountants. Uh, but also regulators. I, I touched upon the uh, the law firm work that we do, which is a sector specialism for us. And so we work very closely with the SRA, for example, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the difficulties faced by law firms. So we've got a national footprint of 18 UK office, offices and a team of over 300 professionals, which includes uh, 80 managing directors and directors uh, who lead all of the assignments and mandates. So next one, please. This is uh, the timeline of uh, how the firm's grown and it's quite stark really. It was literally Carl as, as um, uh, briefly touched upon by, by Matt, used to be the uh, head of insolvency at a top 10 firm, um, left that role to set up Quantum in 2013, uh, literally him and a PA. And now fast forward to uh, where we are now, where we've got 18 offices, uh, fee income of around 40 million pounds, an overseas offering in Cyprus, Mauritius, Cayman, uh, the UAE, and we're now considered a top 25 firm according to Accountancy Age's latest 50 plus 50 league table. So we've grown very quickly. Um, and just the other point that I touched upon earlier within that slide is uh, in August 2020 is when we merged with the K3 Capital Group um, and, and that has added um, further national footprint and strengthening in certain of our uh, kind of target offerings. Um, and we've, you know, offered a very substantial um, uh, kind of counter cyclical offering to K3 because they didn't previously do insolvency. And, you know, that's our bread and butter. Next slide. I don't really need to go into this one, but this is a, a rogues gallery of a few of my more uh, photogenic colleagues. I see Carl on there. Is he on there? Oh. <laughs> there you go. Over to Matt. Thanks, Richard. So on the uh, MA division, the mergers and acquisitions division, um, I'll talk you through sort of the various elements of there. And again, this is this has expanded quite quite significantly in, in recent times. So um, we've got uh, sort of Knightsbridge. KBS corporate, KBS corporate Finance. Now, they all look after small business owners who are looking to exit primarily. I mean, we can get involved with uh, transactions that bring on some sort of investment element, but the, the majority of the deals that we tend to look at are for, for business owners, as I say, who are exiting for whatever their reason might be. And, and in this last year, this COVID period, there's certainly been a lot more of those that are looking to, to exit for whatever their reasons are. So, so what you basically got, we, we cover every sector there is, very much as a focus on the small business um, uh, arena. Uh, we cover the whole of the UK. And what basically the, the, the different divisions are looking at different sizes of transactions. So the Knightsbridge team look after the small end of uh, the SME sector. So, um, so yeah, very sort of one-man band, sole traders, small commercial, retail, you know, cafes, that kind of thing on there. Um, and typically sort of no more than two million pounds in terms of the sale price. Uh, the corporate team, uh, as it says on there, sort of you know, half a million up to about 10 million. Um, and then the corporate finance team, typically 10 million and above up to about sort of 250 million or so. So um, those three cover every sector there is within reason. Um, a lot of what we do is very niche, very unusual. Um, and we, we, we do like a taking on a client that maybe is a little bit different to the to the norm it's quite an interesting project for us but yeah we'll, we'll look at anything i think for us and you know my role was going back to my what i do for the company is that you know is it viable do we think there's a market for it and um, do we think we can get a deal and ultimately if all of us can make a a bit of money out of it then that, that's ultimately what we'll, we'll be able to do um night corporate finance they're, they're a specialist division so they they look at the tech side of things they've been going for a, a number of years so typically telecoms it companies cloud services software that side of things. So, so they're they're on the sell side. So the the, the the business there, which we'll explain a bit later on, is there to sort of help it get to the a transaction. We do have a transaction company called Knight Transaction Services, 
and that can just we can bring those in if we need to assist at the sort of the, the business end of things so whilst typically a buyer's law, lawyers will be doing the due diligence on, on the transaction there are occasions where maybe we might need to do some vendor due diligence on that sort of thing so we can help with that um, as a group we've made a number of acquisitions we, we've grown since we listed on aim back in 2017 so uh, we've actually now got a buy side advisory arm as well as we've, as we've gone out and researched and looked at at, at companies through our group, uh, we can now help them advise on that as well, and that something sort of that typically is that, that's more on the higher side of things, more on the sort of corporate finance side sort of transactions through there. Um, debt advisory, that's really again just in, in terms of on, on a structure and a deal. So you know, for private equity and, and for trade, I mean, with a private equity company, you know, they often use some of their own funding and maybe look to secure some debt as well on the things so we can help out and you know, provide some advisory guidance on that side of things as well. And we do have our own. Um, internal tax advisory division as well from the, on the sell side so yeah that's that's the sort of group structure on the mergers and acquisition side moving on next one please there we go okay right so in terms of so where do we so who, who are we and where do we sit in the in, in the market um so we are according to refinitiv now refinitiv are a six billion dollar uh, company previously thompson reuters they provide a lot of analysis on mergers and acquisitions around the world. Um, in the UK, according to Refinitiv, uh, we have been the UK's most active sell side advisor um, in what we refer to, or what they refer to as a small cap and a mid cap. So that's a sort of up to 50 million, uh, what they make $50 million as they refer to, because they're an American company on there. So we've been the top of the charts now for four years. We're gonna, if, we should be top of the charts for this year as well, according to some of the numbers, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit later on. So yeah, go for 25 years in that time. And we transacted on, as it says there, you know, three and a half thousand, it was worth over five billion pounds worth of coverage and as i've already mentioned yeah we do cover the entire uk from there um so yes in terms of it's so a bit, bit more stats what, what's going on at this moment um so, so i've been with the company for over eight years and we are in a period that we've never seen before I mean, it's, it's extraordinary levels of numbers so i mean i'm going to go through some of the increases and i mean to put, put this into context you know year on year if we can get a three or a four or five percent increase on any of these kpis we generally consider that a good year, but um, you know, this last six months in terms of interested parties, so potential buyers that we're speaking to about the clients, the transactions that we're working on, yeah, that's gone up by you know nearly nearly twenty five percent. We've you know conducted more twenty seven percent more buyer meetings for our clients over this last six months than than the previous period. Um, number of offers again up by twenty five percent. We never said every single number is just extraordinary at the moment, and we'll, we'll go through what's happening a bit later on. Um, and then, yeah, we've completed on 245 deals in the first nine months of this year. Put that into context, 2018, we completed on 118 deals for the entire year. So, you know, 245 deals in nine months, it's, it's, it's like, you know, record breaking all the time. Um, and across the board, on the last note there, you know, there's been 255 billion pounds worth of transactions for the first three quarters of this year, you know, across the, the UK and the market. So, yeah, busy times. Okay, so the next three slides will go into some further detail about what Quantum does. Um, I'll try and rattle through them. Um, but the, the so this one explains our financial advisory offering. And this is where we work alongside other professionals and other advisors to comprehens comprehensively analyze how a business is performing. Um, so this will set out clear plans and actions that can be taken to turn a business around um, and to implement uh, financial and operational changes that can increase performance and maximise value to stakeholders. Now, services in this include business reviews and turnaround and performance improvement. So the, the review might be a report to a key stake, stakeholder, such as the board, potentially as a lender. Um, but yeah, so that is an, a brief outline of our, our financial advisory offering. On to the next one, please. Special situations is where um, the various teams within Quantum have come together to assist uh, the restructuring advisory team and provide uh, integrated M&A support across stressed or distressed uh, transactions. Now that can include uh, insolvent sales, such as via a prepack administration, for example, um, but our team is focused on delivering the maximum value for clients in what's often complex or unpredictable situations. And the next one. 
So this is really our bread and butter. We are a restructuring and insolvency business predominantly, um, and a lot of that is in the corporate world. Um, so we will go from advising directors or, or lenders um, about the stress or distress in their business. Um, the opportunities are usually introduced to us by one of their advisors, often an accountant, sometimes a lawyer. Um, but we also work very closely with uh, challenger lenders, peer-to-peer uh, -peer funders. Um, for example, we're on the Funding Circle panel, but there's various others that we work closely with. And as part of our advisory work, we also uh, you know, perform the uh, formal insolvency process. So, for example, as we touched on here, we are the administrators of Derby County. We are responsible for that day to day. Um, and there's hundreds of different appointments, whether it be liquidations, administrations or uh, company voluntary arrangements, along with uh, the personal appointments touched upon uh, by Matt. So we do personal advisory work, but also when required, uh, we can be appointed as trustees in bankruptcies or put together individual voluntary arrangements. Okay. This one's back to Matt. Yeah, okay. So clearly haven't got time to go through the entire process of how we would take a business to market and, and, and the various elements of it. I think, and it, and it does vary slightly between the different divisions as well. Everyone's got a slightly different approach because you know a 50 million pound deal was going to be treated differently to a 500,000 pound deal, as I'm sure you can imagine. But in essence, the, I suppose the, the, the concept of how we deliver it, it's, 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 it's fairly standard across the, across the board. So first and foremost, you know, it's understanding the business, understanding the objectives of our clients. So this, you know, this is partly my side of things, partly the team that are assigned to work with our clients on there. Um, so really it's a fact find getting under the skin. From that, we can then start looking at bringing in a, a document writer who can then start producing some of the materials we're going to use. So you, you might be a word of terminology, things like teasers and information memorandums. It's, Feedback we get from from a lot of the private equity and the investment houses that you know a lot of the stuff we produce is best in class. You know we've got dedicated document writers, we've got dedicated researchers. You know it's a, it's a, it's a very well oiled machine that that works in the background here. You know very much in, in terms of your side of things on, on the accountancy side. I'm, I'm sure over the years you've, you've probably helped some of your clients on this side of things, but we'd be looking for you know help with the accounts in terms of okay, well let's talk through things like depreciation. You know are there are there elements of the depreciation maybe that can be put back into the profitability things like non-recurring expenses, directors, pensions, that side of things, because ultimately what all of those side of things can do is can help in terms of that bottom line profit figure, which ultimately will help drive a higher value for the client, which is ultimately what we all want to achieve from there. So, so yeah, so we understand the business. We, we produce some sort of class leading documentation to support the project as we go through. Um, we've got, we, we, we conduct sort of buyer research meetings with our clients, develop a strategy between us we've got a huge database you know 25 years of, of, of transacting deals on there we've got some bespoke software that was created for us a couple of years ago um, it's like nothing else in the marketplace we've got our buyer matching engine so it really really can really go out there and, and reach essentially the globe i mean we're not restricted to just the uk we do a lot of overseas and you know international buyers and, and particularly this year it's been a very very busy year for that side of things and yeah we basically project manage the whole thing and again in terms of at the end, the transactional side of things, you know, often we'll, we'll look to the, the, the client's accountant to help with, you know, if, if the buyers have got some questions about, you know, cost base, what's being put through here, why is that, that, that sort of thing on there. So, you know, quite often accountants are very, very close to the project and, and, and you know, we all work together as a team to ultimately deliver the deal and, and, and get the deal done. So, um, yeah, that's a sort of a very brief summary of how it works. Okay. So this is just designed to give you a brief overview of how we can support you and how we operate. Um, so our focus is always on working with you and your firm to, to add value to relationships. Um, we're certainly not interested in, in taking clients away uh, or treading on anyone's toes. There's obviously in insolvency, there can be a difficult relationship where um, an accountant can refer a client to us. Um, and then ultimately, if we're appointed and find out that something's gone wrong beforehand and we need to potentially recover something from the director, you know, these are circumstances that we come across often. Um, and so we're very careful about how we deal with that with, with you alongside your clients so that we, we manage things in the right way. Um, we always look to refer back to our network wherever we can. Um, and uh, as we touched upon before, 
um, both within Quantum and the, the wider part of the K3 group. We've got excellent relationships with the lending market. So we can provide assistance there. And that's from the high street banks through the ABLs and alternative lenders. On the next one. So here, um, just want to point out or reiterate that our team is extremely experienced. Um, there are certain areas where, where we are genuinely market leaders. So certainly in advising uh, solicitors practices of all shapes and sizes, uh, we are top of the tree bar none in terms of our experience. And it's a very techy area. Uh, as I say, we work closely with the SRA on that and, and certainly you know, should be considered um, at the top of anyone's list if, if you're advising a, a, a lawyer or a law practice that's in difficulty. Um, we are uh, strong communicators. Um, we're used to reporting back to uh, key stakeholders at regular intervals, and we're very open and transparent to the extent that we can be uh, whenever doing so. And then we're flexible with our approach. Um, and that includes our, our, our fee position. Um, and the final point here is that we're quite a new business and so we're used to being mobile and flexible generally. Uh, we like new ideas, we like being different, we like trying new things. Um, and so uh, I think that the fact that we are so new, there's been a lot of uh, sort of mobility within the business since we started. And that's something that we're keen to kind of continue. So we're, we're all ears really when it comes to ideas or, or or things that we can do differently or better. Richard, can I just ask, because um, I'm aware that Quantum has helped one of our members as well. So that expertise you've mentioned in legal, uh, the legal field, does, to what extent does that extend to accountants in practice as well? Because I guess some of the issues of you know, regulation and, and, and professional institutes and so on, and there, there's some commonality. Absolutely. So a lot of the, the problems are the same, whether it be, you know, um, an issue with professional indemnity insurance, um, an issue with something that's gone wrong, um, an issue with general practice management or uh, maybe a dispute between partners. There's lots of common issues that will come up and be transferable. Um, some of the, uh, the technical points in how you deal with the, um, the regulator might be slightly different. Uh, but the approach is very much the same. Um, and so we've certainly got a lot of experience uh, in all professional services. Um, law firms happen to be the biggest, but we also do a lot of work, for example, with IFAs at the moment. So an SEA regulated businesses. Thank you. Do you want to just skip, I'll skip you a slide onto there. Yeah. So this is an initiative um, that came about at the start of the year. Um, and we launched K3 Hub as a membership group, um, and we now have 1,600 members. Um, and uh, the benefits of being a member include a, a, an integrated training program and CPD program. Um, that's regular courses which are delivered by Tolly on our behalf. And there's also unstructured CPD, um, of which today's session is an example. Um, so our members can access the broad range of professional services within the group. Um, and for certain types of work, unfortunately not insolvency, but for other types of work, uh, there's a potential for um, a referral fee in return. And that's something, so the CPD training courses through Tollis, for example, that's something that through Marie at Quantuma, we've been extending out to uh, our members. So that's something that will we'll continue. Uh, I'm assuming you probably want to go yes there so this this slide goes a bit more to the core about what we do and what we see and how it impacts your clients and how you can help them and how we can help them um so in the first one uh, the first box there director's duties i think it's important first of all to uh we talked about insolvency but just to uh, uh, define what it is so there's two definitions. The first one is that a company, let's just talk about companies for now, but a company is insolvent if its liabilities are greater than its assets. Now, there is some case law around it that makes it slightly more complex than that, but as a, a broad baseline, it is true. The second measure, which is more common, is that a company is insolvent if it is unable to pay its debts as and when they fall due. 
So just let's leave that there, but bear it in mind as, as we uh, go through uh, these boxes here. So the duties of a director when a company is trading normally um, defined in the Companies Act 2006, and they include a duty to promote the success of the company, uh, to act within the powers conferred by its mem and arts, and to exercise reasonable skill, care, and, and diligence. Now, it always strikes us that the, the bar to being a, a director is very low. You can essentially buy an off-the-shelf company and be a director straight away, um, subject to certain restrictions, but that's generally the case. However, um, the standards to which directors are held, particularly in an insolvency situation, is very high. So once a company does become insolvent, and that's when a director knows or ought to know that one of those two measures has been met. Um, the, uh, the duties of the director change from essentially being uh, to maximizing the value for shareholders to acting in the best interest of creditors, making sure that the position doesn't get worse for creditors um, and that the, uh, that the creditor position doesn't increase. And so from between the time when the, when the director knows that that's the case and the formal insolvency appointment, the directors have to be aware of their risks. Okay, so on to the next point, the practical steps that can be taken around this are, are, are quite far ranging, but the key one is to take advice, take insolvency advice. We spend a lot of time talking to directors about what they should and shouldn't do in the period um, where they know there's a problem to when an insolvency practitioner is formally appointed. You know, to touch upon a few of them, there shouldn't be any further credit taken for goods and services. Um, assets shouldn't be disposed of, except maybe if they're perishable or if um, it's required to protect the company's value generally. Um, you shouldn't be providing goods or services on credit to existing creditors. Um, and the assets of the company should be safeguarded and all insurances should be maintained. There's various other things that we can mention and, and that we contain in our, even in our engagement terms, there's letters of advice that we send out straight away. Um, and obviously a, a first meeting with the director would be um, uh, on, on the house, if you like. Um, and so these are the sorts of points that we would run through at that point. One thing that comes up a lot in insolvency events is director's loan accounts. So obviously a lot of directors get paid by drawings and by converting those drawings to dividends at, at the, the given time, whenever that might be. And that is fine until an insolvency event happens and it invariably happens partway through a year. And if there is a, um, a, a balance outstanding there, an overdrawn balance to the director, then that's an asset of the company to be reclaimed. So in order to make sure that the clients are best protected, all, um, all transactions relating to the overdrawn loan account or the loan account, the operation of the loan account have to be up to date and maintained properly, supported with receipts or supporting documentation where possible. And key decisions have to be made um, uh, have to be documented uh, when it relates to cash withdrawals from the company's accounts. And it's important around this whole period, whenever a director is making a decision, whether it's to continue to trade, whether it's to make significant payments, um, you know, anything like that, director's board minutes are absolutely critical, formal documents of decisions being made and why they're made. It might, in hindsight, turn out that it's not the right decision, but at least if you can see contemporary notes of why a decision was made at the time, it, it can put a far better spin on it for, for clients um, if they end up in hot water later on. So the next point is about um, bounce back loans. Now, obviously this is something that is only becoming an issue um, around now because these are to do with loans taken out specifically to do with COVID um, and the repayment uh, dates are, are only coming, coming due um, at the moment. The problems arise here is where um, loans were taken 
uh, unsecured loans, not personally guaranteed loans were taken into a business. The issue is then how the money was used. If the money was then used to pay a director, then there may be a problem in an insolvency scenario. And so it may have the effect of actually turning what was a not personally guaranteed loan into effectively a personally guaranteed loan because an insolvency practitioner would have to look into the circumstances of that payment and the use of those monies and whether an action should be brought about, uh, um, against the director to recover money for the benefit of the company and its creditors. Now, this is increasingly going to come into the spotlight, not just because of the timing and the fact that it's, it's new and it's only becoming relevant now, but the authorities are very alive to this issue and they are putting pressure on um, the insolvency practitioners to investigate this issue and to make sure they are recovering money for the companies and creditors. So it is going to be something that comes up again and again and again. And we're keen to advise as soon as possible so that we can help um, your clients to minimize their risk in this area. So the final point on this slide, um, there's been quite a lot of law changes in insolvency that's been COVID related. Um, some that's not been COVID related as well, that's happened in the same period. Um, but I wanted to touch upon the key points uh, and the key restrictions that are changing now um, as we come out of the, the kind of COVID era, era, if you like. The first one is that there was a restriction on uh, winding up petitions being brought against companies, a complete ban. Now that restriction has been lifted the change that's been made is that um, whereas previously a winding up petition could be brought uh, by any creditor who had a debt over 70, 750 pounds, the limit is now 10,000 pounds. It can still, um, we actually don't think that it's going to make a great deal of difference because most debts um, that are uh, under which winding up petitions are brought exceed 10,000 pounds anyway, but there will be some uh, businesses that it helps, particularly at the smaller end of the scale. One change in the process as well is that um, there's now an extra 21 day period where creditors are asked to um, negotiate essentially and arrange uh, or offer the company um, that owes the money the opportunity to put in place a sensible repayment proposal. So there is an extra layer in the winding up process now. Now, the restrictions that were in place before that have been lifted in terms of um, presenting winding up petitions do remain in place when it comes to commercial landlords. So they cannot bring winding up petitions against tenants in relation to uh, arrears that were built up during the pandemic. That remains in place. So commercial tenants uh, continue to be protected from eviction as a result. And these provisions uh, are currently scheduled to remain in place until the 31st of March, 2022. As with a lot of these things, uh, those dates have been pushed out previously. And so that's only the current position. It might still be pushed out further. The one final point I wanna make on this is surrounding winding up petitions again. Um, and it's uh, an issue around what happens once a company has received a petition, once that has been presented. Now, the law states that once the company then subsequently goes into liquidation, into compulsory liquidation, the payments made during the company, during that period between the presentation of the petition and the winding up order are automatically void, automatically void. It's quite a strong position um, that the legislation takes. Now that um, the, the company or, or various other parties can apply to the court for those payments to be ratified. However, the court would only do so if those payments are justified and they can only really be justified at that point if they're protecting the company's assets um, and not making the position worse for creditors. The reason why I think this is important is because um, petitions that have been presented since the restrictions have been lifted at the 1st of October are only being heard in April next year. And that's going to be extended out. And that's because of court backlogs. 
And so there's a potential for a long time between presentation and petition and a winding up order being made. There's lots of payments. Obviously, the banks will try and freeze the accounts, but there are instances where there's a you know ways and means to get around that. And money might be going out the door, and ultimately that could come back to uh, bite the client later on once an insolvency practitioner is appointed. Over to Matt. Sorry, Richard. Just uh, yeah. thanks for that session because I think before Matt picks up on the corporate finance, I probably want to ask you something you touched on earlier it's actually a difficult question so i'll apologize in advance but it's something that you know, i've spoken with um, our members about before and it's a recurrent um issue that that raises its head and you say you touched on it and that is that obviously lots of accountants they'll, they'll talk to insolvency specialists insolvency practitioners um to get advice for their clients um and the relationship's great at that point and then i think you touched on it as i said and then you're appointed to be the liquidator of the company for example and that changes the dynamic significantly and i think it's important to be open about that because i think what the client forgets is that what i think that shifts is that your duty of care is no longer to them as the client it's actually to the creditors and that can be quite a difficult relationship therefore between the professional that introduces you to the client that um got you to you know give advice to the client and a client might well turn around to the accountant and go they're suddenly being difficult now that a liquidator you introduce to these people what's going on how do you deal with yeah how do you manage that situation because it's quite common isn't it it is common yeah it's it's, it's a common uh, kind of tightrope to be negotiated really um so it goes back to some of the points that were made in the in the slides about how we operate now I would much rather speak to, uh, obviously you can only do it if you're aware of the situation, but I'd rather speak to the client, um, the accountant and the director on day one, highlight an issue um, and discuss how, what, what it's going to look like essentially to deal with that issue. Um, you know, we're frequently in, in a position where, yes, it's going to cost the director some money, because they've taken out more than the law says they should have done in a certain situation. Um, but it's about trying to be realistic and, and uh, sensible about how we deal with that. Um, and not, uh, you know, what can happen is if cases are, are um, land with certain consultancy practitioners, they might charge a very low fee early on, not mention the issues, get appointed, and then just want the, the director's head on a block. That's not how we operate. You know, we want to make sure that we've got a sensible solution for everyone and something that is, you know, it's like it is a negotiation at the end of the day, isn't it? But sort of something that everyone's a bit unhappy with, and then you're probably about in the right place. But we're certainly not in interested in, um, uh, you know, if people have made mistakes, then just hammering them for that mistake. We have to fulfill our duties. We have to do things right. Um, but there are ways and means of doing it. And we are very conscious of that. Thank you. Right. So um, just finish up conscious of time as well. So I'll, I'll try and wrap this last slide up um, uh, fairly briefly. So I think just referring back to my last slide, I talked through how active it's been, how we're smashing all the records, how, you know, without wishing to blow, blow an arrow in trumpet, but it's just very, very busy. So so what, why is it busy? I mean, I suppose this is relevant if you've got clients that, you know, are talking about it. No, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, you know, hanging up my boots and exiting. Um, what's the market like? What have you heard on the, on the street? So it, it's, it's been really boring, but there's lots of reasons. We probably haven't got time to go through everything. But um, I mean, last year, I mean, you'll, you'll recall that Entrepreneurs Relief was nearly scrapped. I mean, it got renamed to Business Asset Disposal Relief. The 10 million pound allowance got dropped to a million. I think most people within our industry, we felt that was the sort of the warning sign that it was probably going to be scrapped in the March budget just gone. Um, the Office of Tax Simplification produced a report to Rishi last year recommending that he put capital gains tax up to 40% for exiting shareholders. So that kind of was, I mean, you know, we don't get people phoning us up. It's very rare someone phones up to, like, I'm thinking of selling because I've heard taxes are going to go up, you know, but it's the it's the, often the final nudge that's needed. So 
you know, this Q1 this year with the, with the fear of those changes happening, uh, it produced a lot of activity, nothing happening, as you recall, back in March, um, but it's carried on. And then right, there was fears about, you know, the autumn budget, maybe, you know, capital gains tax came up again as a possible route for, for Rishi, but thankfully um, nothing's really happened on there. But, you know, potentially, who knows what's going to happen next year? I suppose it depends what happens with the country and everything else from there. But it, it's certainly been one of the factors driving things through. Private equity investment, we do a lot, of, you know, for some, some of the bigger deals, we do a lot of private equity investment back deals. You know, they had a fairly slow summer last year. And they sort of took stock to see what was going on with the market. But, you know, they've come back with some vengeance this year. And there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of what was referred to as dry powder, you know, the uninvested money is at record levels out there. You know, a lot of interest rates were cut you know, beginning of this period last year. So that a lot of activity, a lot of buyers, money markets were very active. You know, how long the interest rates are going to stay as they are, who knows? But at the moment, again, that's sort of driving things forward on there. And yeah, I mean, you know, just the situation. I mean, it's not, you know, this, I mean, what, you know, I'm sure you've got spread amongst your clients, but there's an awful lot of companies that have done very, very well through this period. And, you know, we, we've been helping companies that want to exit just because they're looking to cast their chips in. And, you know, that, that continues to happen. You know, it's all... It's, it, it's, so many things have changed in this last period. So, um, you know, a lot of acquisitions are, you know, there's, there's this sort of what we refer to with the offensive or defensive mergers acquisitions. So offensive is, you know, really pushing it and going for it and going and striking while the iron's hot and you're, you're on a roll and let's go out and really strengthen the group. Others have, if you have suffered through this period, you know, a quick way, I mean, particularly if you're a PLC or a bigger group, if you, you know, if, you, if you've had a bit of a hit in terms of turnover and, and profits, then, you know, making an acquisition can, can recover your position quite quickly. It's a very quick fix for that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, very, very buoyant. Um, uh, you know, very, as I say, the numbers on there, we're experiencing re record levels of transactions and 2022 looking good. No reason for it to change. But still, you know, we're going to finish off this year, you know, in terms, in terms of the calendar year with, you know, looking at our work in, our work, work in progress. It's, it's got a very strong end of the year in 2022. No real difference ahead. So, yeah, all, all very, all very buoyant as a message, I think, to finish off with a couple of minutes to go. I have uh, lost your sound, Matt. Can I ever... try again? Uh, no, that's that's so uh, that, that, that's me done. So I think I, I'm, I'm I'm all right with the, with that slide. So I think it's the final. I think the last couple of slides are yeah circulate around. I'm going to have the contact details on for the various people. I believe it's it's Matt Hall. I've lost his. Oh, that, not not me, right? <laughs> <laughs> too many, too many marks. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 coming and going a bit there, Matt Hall. Um, we're getting bitsy. Um, thank you very much for that, chaps. Um, it's good to know as as accountants and practice. I have a, a a small practice myself alongside the uh, Armadillo Network, and it's good to know where we can come to for uh, support and advice on these things, both the um, business sale, uh, you know, the, the corporate finance, the business sale um, side of things, but also when the, the companies are struggling, in trouble, where we can come to on uh, rest recovery, restructuring, all these things that you've, you've gone through today. Um, uh, appreciate that. Uh, if we've got, uh, we bang on time, but if we've got any questions from the members, they can certainly, un uh, unmute themselves or turn their cameras back on or use the chat box. Your last slide there was really how to get in touch. Um, I presume if members want to come through us in the first instance, we can uh, certainly make the introductions. Um, and I think we've really still to roll out to members the bit regarding the KC Capital Group's offering on uh, uh, Tolly's webinars, et cetera. So uh, lots of interesting stuff in there. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, Good. Uh, my my contact details were on earlier on the slide. I don't think Matt's were, so um, I don't know if uh, that's something that I guess the slides will be circulated. Will they? Yes, we'll mm -hmm. circulate the slides as a as a PDF. Make sure people have got that. And in the first instance, I think the members are aware that you know they come through us and we'll put them in touch. So sure. Okay. Perfect. <laughs>